Now we're going to do the second half of the stress of validity that are in the yin book. Um, again, the, this is what these are. We're going to now look at construct validity and reliability. This is this chart's again on page 45. And again, these are things to either explicitly or implicitly put in your research design that you have considered these threats to validity and your design and your data collecting process should overcome them. So construct validity is identifying correct operational measures for the concepts being studied. That means you need to tell me what you're studying, be very clear on what you're studying, and how you would know that that thing has changed. That it's not just your opinion, but that other people can agree that it's changed. And you should be honest about the shortcomings of your evidence. You should be, this goes back to external validity of how well you can generalize your results. Um, but so what's important though is to use, if you use multiple sources of evidence, as well as if you use a chain of evidence, it's more convincing. Um, so for example, if you're saying neighborhood change is what you're studying, what is the neighborhood? What's the geography? You have to tell me that definition. And then you have to tell me how are you going to measure it? So racial turnover, housing deterioration, economic institutions, urban services, all these are ways that you can demonstrate that yes, change is occurring, not just according to me. So what's very important is bounding the unit of analysis. Uh, you have to be very clear of who or what you are studying, what you're not studying. So concrete definition would be specific individuals, small groups, or specific organizations, or even specific partnerships. It's very clear of who's in and who's out. Studying a whole community is a little bit more difficult as is studying relationships. This is on page uh, 35 if you want to look at this discussion. Um, specific decision. It's very difficult to discern what you're specifically studying, and this is important to keep in mind when you are selecting your specific topic. And if your research question does not lead you to favoring one unit over another, meaning your question doesn't really call for the use of studying one particular group, then maybe your question might not be, it might be too vague for a case study like this. Um, and then the other thing to, to note on page 54 and 55 is a holistic versus embedded case study. Holistic, this is just for your own reading um, or to be aware of. A holistic, you're, look, you're examining the entire group, but let's say you're looking at within an organization the different um, levels of management. So if you're looking at how management behaves, how uh, support staff behaves, how workers behave, that'd be embedded where you're looking at multiple groups inside a larger group. But that's just something to keep in mind. Um, and I would definitely read up on that if you're trying to figure out what specific groups are targeted by your questions. So looking at the multiple sources of evidence, this chart's on page 106, um, and all of these help define the concept and measure change. Uh, this is a big chart, I'm going to go through it a little bit, but again, this is definitely worth reading when you're trying to decide the sources for your own data. Um, each, as you can see, has their own strength and weakness, um, and it's important to realize that they're complementary, that one strength is another weakness, and to make your case, you should really be balancing those out. And there's other things that are not listed here, and including films, uh, photographs, psychological tests, ethnographies, personal histories. But these are the main ones, but feel free to explore others uh, through the guidance of your professor and TAs. So the basics of what documents are or archival records, um, these are letters, emails, diaries, notes. Typically what you think of would be in um, documentation or archives. As like others, it's used to corroborate and augment other sources of evidence, as well as add specific details that you might not know of. It's going to include physical artifacts, such as art, um, or even, let's say you're doing a classroom observation, the students are working on something. Um, what they're working on might not be part of your study, but that it still is a physical artifact. Um, and the weakness of this is that the inferences are not unmitigated truth, meaning that what you're reading in these documents might not be the truth. They each have had their own purpose, their own production, their own audience. So if you're reading, let's say, an email from one person to another, including that as your evidence, that person might be lying, that person might have an agenda. So that type of thing you have to realize, well, who's the audience and who's the producer for all these documents? But just to give you some of the basics of it, interviews are, in this case, are guided conversations as opposed to structured queries. And that means, according to the book, you want to be open to different interpretations, opinions, and insights and explanations that the interviewee gives and kind of follow them along their path. Um, direct observations are more uh, formal and you can just be hanging out on a sidewalk, watching a meeting in a classroom with a specific task, or they can be informal where during interviews you notice how people are behaving in certain manners or you're looking around the room you're in, uh, you're looking at the greater community of where they want you to be working. Those are all informal direct observations. And finally, participant observation is the most um, direct. 
as opposed to being just passive, you're actively engaged. Uh, you are, uh, it could be ca casual social interactions or it could be purposive. You could be going up to just wandering up through a neighborhood or you could go into purpose like and start a conversation with a specific person. You could see what happens when there's a commotion. You could cause a scene and see how people react. That's participant observation. You're basically manipulating from the inside. And the difference from that is that you have to be worried about bias, recall, or inaccurate articulation in all of this. Um, all people are biased, and even you. So if you're getting your data from yourself via direct observation or participant observation, you might have a certain agenda, um, and that would cause some problems. Uh, likewise, the people you're speaking with might have an agenda, so that might also not be the truth. Um, so ultimately, the goal to help construct validity is triangulation. You want all these forms of evidence to converge on the same finding. Um, and that helps us reconstruct that a single reality definitely did happen, and it happened the way that you're presenting it. Uh, so if you, in that way, we get confidence that your case study um, rendered the event as opposed to just an individual's interpretation of what happened. Um, and to, for further construct of validity, you want to create a chain of evidence. How would an external observer follow what you have done, um, your, your derivation from your questions to your conclusion, based off the evidence you find? So if you were a court lawyer presenting evidence of a crime, how would you prove that happened? Which means you should be indicating how the evidence was collected so I can believe it, and then it should be consistent with your case study protocol, which I'll go into. So if you really want to think about it, how would you convince someone that this class actually happened, or you actually watched this video? If you just told them, I don't believe you. So what, what type of evidence could you collect that would show that, yes, I did do this? Phone records, um, email records, bills, things like that. And the last one is reliability. Um, this is the last threat. And this is you want to demonstrate that the operations of a study can be repeated with the same results. And this is repeating the same study over again. It's almost as if someone was watching over your shoulder and watch you do this work. Would they come to the same conclusion? So to do this, you need to really just document your procedures in a case study protocol and a case study database. But I'll quickly say what it means to be both accurate and precise when we're talking about reliability. I want someone to come to the exact same conclusions that you do, which would be the bottom right, right target right there. Um, so one can be accurate, meaning that you could be saying correct things, but they're not at your same conclusion. You could also be precise, whereas everyone who reads your, your paper or sees your evidence would come to the same conclusion, but it's not the true one. So you want everyone to come to the true conclusion, and you want people to be able to repeat that multiple times if they were to follow you along. So to do that, you use a case study protocol. Um, which has four main sections to it. This is on page 84 to 95 They go through all these, uh, where you need an overview of your case study, why, what you're doing, the data collection procedures, and this is go through the other threats to validity, data collection questions to keep your mind on the data collection process the whole time, and as a guide for the conclusion. Um, you should, for each of your questions, you should list which types of evidence uh, you will be using in that section. Um, so going back to the unit analysis, what I mean by that, the questions that you have in your uh, case study protocol, uh, they should cater to the unit of the case study, which might differ from the unit of data collection. So if you, for example, um, are studying how an organization works, you might be interviewing individuals. But your overall questions still need to be themed on how the organization function, functions. So this chart on page 92 definitely helps remind us that if we're studying individuals, we could do it at an organizational level through their documents or vice versa. And finally, you need to uh, make a case study database, which is just organizing and collecting all the information that you have done in the project, whether it be field notes, observations, documents, um, your interpretations of these. It's just keeping them there. And you need this to, or they need to be organized so you're not just, again, giving me a narrative. You have to tell us what's going on. It's a case study, not just a story. Um, and when you have all this data in one place and you make it available through footnotes or however, it enables the reader to, if they have other conclusions, they can second guess you and go back to the work themselves. Or they can say, hmm, they did footnote this. This all seems like it's very true. I'm going to believe the answer. So your goal is like a take-home exam. You have all the evidence in your case study database and you have to put it in through footnotes and citations so I can, or any reader can follow you along. So what you should have learned in this one, um, we discussed what construct validity are and reliability are and how we can strengthen construct validity via uh, triangulation and multiple methods of data, and how we can strengthen reliability, which would be through our case study 
protocol and our case study design, which you'll be working on shortly.